So you're just crunching and scrunching. I enjoy doing it actually. This is a good at the end of the day. Mm. You have a little frustrations, you can come and make some sauerkraut, give it a little massage. But what I'm doing is I'm helping it break down those cell walls um, to release the juices. And you can see even now, as we're going, it's starting to make brine. Yeah, yeah, dripping. you got juice. Wow. Yeah, it's that quick. So if you have kids, this is a great way to involve them in the kitchen. You give them some chopped cabbage and a big bowl and Go put to. a little salt in it and then have them do whatever they <laughs> want to do. And you've got a few minutes to continue to do something else mm -hmm. in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And the other cool thing is, you know, when kids are part of making it, they're going to be part of watching this food develop and change, and then they're going to enjoy eating it as well, and it's so good for them. Welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. My guests today are Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Who are the authors of this gorgeous book, Fermented Vegetables, and catch the delightful, delicious subtitle, Creative Recipes for Fermenting 64 Vegetables and Herbs in Krauts, Kimchis, brined pickles, chutneys, <laughs> relish, relishes, and pastes. That's a mouthful. It is. And I want to <laughs> add, not only is it a mouthful, it is a gorgeous book full of pictures and recipes and ideas and people. I mean, you made it shock full. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Tell us. Thank you. I want to start by give us a little bit of story. How mm. did you get into fermenting vegetables? Uh, so it started at Christmas, under the Christmas tree, um, a long time ago, 1999. Uh, we have a homestead, and Kirsten's mom gave us a package, and she said, don't turn it over, be careful. So when we opened it up, inside was a bubbling crock of kraut. And the kids were a little concerned. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was alive and bubbling? Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, the aroma. Ah, <laughs> and a something different. And, yeah. a, and a copy of Sally Found's book. And that's what got us started. Nourishing the Nourishing Traditions Absolutely. book? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's where I learned to ferment. Okay, yeah. carry on. And that's it. And then for the next 10 years, uh, mostly Kirsten was making ferments in the kitchen for the kids and I. And then um, we tried a number of things as homesteaders to make it. We did uh, uh, different dairy options. We milked cows and goats. Mm -hmm. We made lots of yummy cheeses. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned to be a cider maker. And we did hard ciders, mm. um, but nothing was something, and our dream was always to work together. So that's the dream that we kept chasing. And then finally, we were giving fermented vegetables away, um, as, and people really enjoyed them. And so that's when we decided, you know, I think we're best at fermented vegetables. Let's just try that. And what did you do? I mean, so then what? Tell us what happened with your fermented vegetables. So then we started a business, and um, we created, uh, we built a certified kitchen onto the farmhouse, USDA certified kitchen, with his and her fermenting caves on the side, built into the hillside, <laughs> because I hadn't given up the dream of make, being a cider maker yet. Mm -hmm. So I was still making probably 120 gallons of cider, and we were doing fermented vegetables. We did all stone crocks, so we made German crocks and Polish crocks, Bungy pots. The big, the big stone yeah. mm -hmm. ceramic. Yeah, and at first we were just um, fermenting uh, cabbage mostly with um, what we were doing with the flavor instead of just plain kraut was um, lemon and dill or mm -hmm. um, adding different herbs to the krauts themselves. And we were having a lot of fun with that, but we hadn't really had the idea of doing a bunch of vegetables yet. I, I was starting to add more things to the krauts, uh, carrots and onions and garlic, but to do a fermented kraut without cabbage. Mm. Um, that happened about two or three months into the business. We have a farmer friend named Mary and she would have a surplus of things and she would call me up and say, so, parsnips. Do parsnips ferment? And I be on the phone, uh, I don't know. 
And this was before there was a lot out there on um, fermentation like there is now. Now you just go do a Google search on parsnips and somebody, whether it's worked or not, they've got a story or a recipe. Mm -hmm. And you know, with most everything, it was like, well, I'm not seeing that it's going to kill us, so let's try. Mm -hmm. And um, we would, you know, I would try maybe three or four different things in a small batch with some parsnips, and then we'd just just go for it. So Mary kept pushing my envelope of what can be fermented, and so slowly we had more crazy things at the vegetable. Mm -hmm. And so what did you do with them besides feed your kids? This is when it was a business. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So we did farmers markets, we did uh, restaurants, mm -hmm. and all in Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. and also in the Bend area. Um, we did fairs, we did uh, food festivals, we brought sauerkraut where sauerkraut had not gone before. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and it was, yeah, so we heard a lot of stories, we introduced a lot of people to it that just felt they didn't like it until they Well, frankly, I like didn't it. like sauerkraut uh -huh. until I started to make it and I could make it milder than mm -hmm. the commercial right. Right. sauerkrauts, because sour isn't my favorite taste. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I didn't know that you could have it mild or interesting, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which I'm going to kind of reach behind behind you, Kirsten. You brought, and we'll we'll taste some of these later. Some of the things that you've made that that people sounds like in your in your business in the book, people would come back and give you feedback about oh, trying yeah. these people, different people things. People aren't shy about feedback. <laughs> <laughs> So. so did that tune what you, you know, what you put together for recipes or other things that you tried? Um, you know, I think everything that actually made it to the, the farmer's market stand didn't, didn't get feedback that, was, that needed fine-tuning, ah, mostly, ah. I think. People were just so excited about the brightness of the flavor and just what they were experiencing. And also the health benefits. I mean, honestly, people were starting to uh, feel better when they were eating the fermented vegetables. So we had a lot of groupies that would just come every week ready for the new flavor and um, mm -hmm. they were really excited about, you know, just eating, eating the food. So that actually is a good th segue into, mm -hmm. tell us what a fermented food is. Let's start at 101 here. <laughs> what's, what's a fermented vegetable or just what, are, what is fermentation? Sure. So all, all the vegetables uh, have lactic acid on them inherently, the bacteria, uh, with, along with all the other bacteria that we have. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what you're doing is you are encouraging this lactic acid bacteria through the process of the sodium um, saline environment. From salt. From salt. salt. To, to reproduce. They eat the um, starches and the mm -hmm. sugars and they begin to reproduce and turn the environment acidic. And it's the acidity that preserves the vegetable and then also gives it the great flavors. And so it's something, I mean, something that's been around for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think, you did more of the history, but I don't think they actually know when the first mm -hmm. ferment right. happened. In I've heard mm -hmm. Sandor Katz talk about that uh, they believe that the Great Wall of China included fermented vegetables to power the people as they went through. So that's wow. one tag of when mm -hmm. it started, but it's been around. It, it was the way to pr preserve vegetables without refrigeration or without any electricity here down to this. And so it's and that's, been around that's a while. One of the advantages that I see is we come into more uncertain times, say with climate, mm -hmm. or as you point out, you know, overabundance in some seasons of some produce is a way to preserve the, the nutrition, mm -hmm. or actually enhance it, um, without taking the amount of energy that it takes, say, to do canning. No, there's no, yeah, and that, that's a huge thing, because all these vegetables here that are fermented, to preserve them in, in the sense of canning, you'd need a pressure cooker, which takes quite a bit of energy, yeah. And, um, yeah. and you lose flavor. I mean, the vegetables come out mush. And that's the other interesting thing, um, so Christopher was talking about the preservation in China, but also the other thing that I read that was happening in China was um, salt was so expensive and it's such an important nutrient to our bodies. And so some of the early fermentation was also to spread the flavor and give them more flavor by you ferment the vegetables with a little bit of salt mm -hmm. and you're, you're spreading that salty flavor mm -hmm. and that nutrient um, for your bland rice. And so it was a good right, way for sure. the, the people that 
the you know the, the peasants, the people that couldn't afford the salt because it was such a high mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, expense ingredient. Your book has kraut, so short for sauerkraut, which mm -hmm. probably comes to, uh, is a German word, all right? So mm -hmm. we know a European heritage. Kimchi, kimchi is what, from Korea, right? What's mm -hmm. the difference between them? Well, making them, the only difference is that whereas with the sauerkrauts, as we'll show you, it's fresh cabbage and you're going to salt it and put it in a jar and you're going to be done. With the kimchi, what we did is we actually make a brine like you're making with pickles, and we're going to soak that um, maybe the night before, so the next day, then we start. So the, the only difference is that the cabbages are pre-soaked mm. in a brine before mm. you make them. I think that's and then, Well, and kimchi is, is really, it, it's a word for pickled vegetables. Kimchi mm. doesn't necessarily mean a specific type of pickled vegetable. It mm. is the catch-all word. I mean, in Korea, there is a kimchi museum, and, you know, there's 180, or there's some number of official kimchi, type of kimchis, but then, of course, in the home kitchen and family recipes, you know, there's thousands. That, I would say, yeah, thousands. Every, every family has right. their And so it, it's really uh -huh. their word for lacto-fermented pickled vegetables. <laughs> You, you've noted in, in, your, in, your, in your book, thank you, that it's, it's also good for, it's healthy for us. In what way mm -hmm. are, are the fermented foods healthy for us? Oh. <laughs> um, they, I, they have a couple of good things going on. There's the um, probiotics, which of course we have a lot in the news and the doctors about is just getting our gut biomes in good shape. Um, we're, we're starting to find out the microbiology of the gut and the biome is, is our mood and our thinking, and it's just so much deeper in how we feel than, than was ever previously known, and I think we're probably only scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. And so this food has a natural source of probiotics. So that's the big one. But then the other thing that's pretty exciting is um, for the vitamins and the absorption, um, once you ferment them, the lactic acid bacteria sort of pre-digests the starches and some of the things that are harder for us to digest mm -hmm. in the first place. And so now the vitamins and minerals are all more bioavailable. And then... Um, from, the, from the vegetables. Mm -hmm. ah. So we eat that carrot raw and we eat that carrot fermented and you're going to get more vitamin C. You're going to get the, a better absorption rate on your minerals. And... Um, Interestingly enough, vitamin B12 is also now part of the picture. Which is kind of magical because I understand that we can't create our own B12. We have to get it from mm -hmm. somebody else. And they right. the, the little, little, little happy bugs there have done the job for us. Absolutely. Plus their hearts. <laughs> well, <laughs> you also say that in your book that, that it's easy to make I mean, get the kids involved. Your kids got involved mm -hmm. with doing it with you. And so sure. I would like to ask if you can show our audience how easy it is to make sauerkraut. Absolutely. Let's, Let's, make some. Let's do it. What does it take to make sauerkraut? Well, we're going to show you, and it's really easy. So the first thing we're going to do is just prep the cabbage. and. And this is a cabbage we just bought today from the co-op. And you can see these, this first outside leaf. I'm going to take that off because it doesn't look that great. And we'll discard that. And then I'm going to save the next leaf or two. And we'll show you what we're going to do with this later. So it's important to pull that one off. Now we're just going to shred. And we cut so many cabbages that we've got a little simple thing to remember. And that's right, right, and core. So what I'm doing is I've got the core right here, and I'm cutting to the right of it. Nice sharp knife. Yep, that's one. To the right of the core. To the right of uh -huh. the core, that's two. And now I have got my core right here, see? And all I'm doing now is just a third cut to remove that core. And now I've got three cabbages that I'm going to start shredding. OK. So while Christopher's shredding, um, I want to talk about salt a little bit because that's often the place where people struggle, where they, they go wrong, because they think it's the salt that preserves. And it's actually um, the salt creates an environment for the lactic acid bacteria to grow um, and produce the lactic acid that is 
the pH change that actually is pH the... pH means the acidity, the acidity. And alkalinity, so it makes it a little more acid? Mm-hmm, makes it more acidic, and um, that is the preservation. Anything below 4.6 acidity is going to last a long time. How long can uh, some fermented vegetables last? Um, you know, many of them last just beautifully about a year in the refrigerator. Yeah. Some of them have a higher sugar content and, and they don't taste as good as long. Mm -hmm. um, some, like peppers, we have a pepper ferment in our refrigerator that just keeps getting better and better and it's been there for four years. Wow. So wow. It's, it's pretty incredible how, how long they last. So you want to talk about salt. We got vegetable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when we were at the market, um, people would come up to us just heartbroken that their little live food that they'd created was too salty and they couldn't eat it. And they'd always ask, so what, what can I do? When will the salt go away? The salt doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. So the best thing you can do is make sure your salt is good and tasty while you're making it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Again, like I said, it's not the salt that preserves, and so you don't need this huge, salty, like the sea flavor. You don't need it to be briny. You just need it to be, that you can taste the salt, like, um, like a chip or something where you taste the salt, you know it's there, but it's not, it's not overwhelming. Good, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, and um, it's, that's about, we do a 1.5% salt in our ferments, which is, Pretty low commercial sauerkrauts are sometimes as much as um, three or more percent, and um, it it works. It's it and it's tasty. Um, a rule of thumb I like to tell people when they're first learning is uh, if fresh. it tastes great fresh, then it's going to be awesome fermented. This is new to me. Uh, you're needing just crunching it and it's getting wet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't need to beat it um, with a pounder. You can if you'd like to, but it helps keep a crunchier consistency if the um, if you're just kneading it and massaging it. And so, what kind of salt are you using? It's got this dark and light. Yeah, this is um, a Redmond real salt, and it is a um, rock salt from Utah. And the cool thing about it is it's got a high mineral content and so the sodium chloride content is a little bit lower than mm. say a kosher salt or some of these really salty salts that are refined to the point of being 100% sodium chloride. Um, so you're getting your minerals and you also are getting a much sweeter flavor ah. instead of that real saltiness, that harsh, that harsh that you right. kosher salt. So you're just crunching and scrunching. I enjoy doing it actually. This is a good at the end of the day. Mm have a little frustrations, you can come and make some sauerkraut, give it a little massage. But what I'm doing is I'm helping it break down those cell walls um, to release the juices. And you can see even now, as we're going, it's starting to make brine. Yeah, yeah, dripping. you got juice. Wow. Yeah, it's that quick. So if you have kids, this is a great way to involve them in the kitchen. You give them some chopped cabbage and a big bowl and Go put a little it. salt in it and then have them do whatever they <laughs> want to do, and you've got a few minutes to continue to do something else mm -hmm. in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And the other cool thing is, you know, when kids are part of making it, they're going to be part of watching this food develop and change, and then they're going to enjoy eating it as well, and it's so good for them. Mm -hmm. So should we put some in a jar? Absolutely. So what I'm going to do first is um, sometimes people just fill the jar up. But what you want to do is knock out those air pockets as you're doing it. And this is where if you have big hands and a friend who has little hands, you can <laughs> hand it off to them. <laughs> and you're just pressing it down to just remove the air pockets. I mean, the magic in this that you're, you're so used to, but I realize is, is we may not all be familiar with, Mm -hmm. is you're trying to create a condition that's anaerobic, that doesn't let oxygen from the air Absolutely. come in and, and spoil the vegetables, right? right? Absolutely. So the salt and the juice, the brine, and the vegetables together, you're creating a little bit of water, like an undersea ocean kind of little world. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You talked about earlier about the good guys, and that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're playing in a little world down here, and what we're doing is we're creating an environment for the good guys, the guys we want, and we're creating an inhospitable environment for the guys that we don't want. So the salinity, as it increases, that predate uh, picks some of the good guys out, 
And the lactobacillus mm. love that environment. There's three different stages they go through. Uh, things like E. coli can't exist in that environment. Mm. And now as Kirsten's getting that brine up. Wow, look at how juicy. I'm yeah. astounded how quickly you've got, she's squeezing the, the, the juice is coming right on up to the top. Wow. Yeah. It's a quick food. And, and think of the brine layer. I mean, this is really the most important thing if you're going to be fermenting is think of your brine layer as your sort of barrier too. It is what keeps your anaerobic um, environment. Mm -hmm. And so then the next thing we do is we put this little cabbage leaf Oh, the one you there. saved out. Uh -huh. yeah. And it, it's just another little layer. It's like, a, I call it a primary follower. And it's just something that's, that's going over the cabbage um, that you've shredded to help keep the brine up a little bit and keep, whoops, let's get that guy poked in there and keeping the shreds from floating up. Because uh, what's gonna happen is this is staying nicely now, but as the um, fermentation starts moving and working, um, you will see little air pockets develop and it is the CO2 that is being off-gassed from the process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you're gonna have to weight it down and what we do often is use, just for this really simple method, there's lots of methods, is a jar filled with water and you can just keep pressing it and in the morning you put this on a plate and cover it like you know with a towel or a napkin or something just to keep it um, out of the dust but you'll see that this will begin to rise up mm. and as it does you don't want to lose it because this brine is your is your magic liquid to conquer ah. conquer everything and make <laughs> it tasty and so um, as you see this brine rising, you'll see air pockets develop in here. And you'll just slowly push on this, and um, that will bring, bring the, the brine back in mm -hmm. and bring those mm -hmm. bubbles back up. And with these small batches, and especially when you're beginning, it's really great to keep it on the counter where you can watch it. It's a live process. Mm -hmm. It's fun to see. It's fun to see in the glass jar. You can see what's going on. You can tell. The when you, are coming mm -hmm. up and, magic and when you need to press it back down, because ah. some people think, oh, well, I make it and I put it away for three weeks. And that's not going to work on this small batch mm -hmm. because the brine might all disappear yeah. the third day and mm -hmm. then you've got a mushy mess. <laughs> and that's so it. you have a, that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. So you watch it, you taste it every, you know, press it down, mm -hmm. taste it every few days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. And that's the exciting part, um, too is that you can really discover where you like the flavor. Yeah. Because some people do like it super acidic and some people prefer it like, you know, I compare it to a half sour pickle, mm -hmm. you know, where the, the flavors are beginning to develop their acidity yet they're not um, super sour yet. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the crunch is also from the salt. Um, the pectins mm. are hardened by the salt mm. and that crunch, you know, stays pretty well but there at the beginning it's still a little a little bit fresher um, mm. and so that's the cool thing about this is there's so many ways you can kind of tweak and change and experiment and play with the flavor in fact um, you have a, a little pet phrase about the brine what is that well we have a shred salt and submerge is the main things to remember and we say when it's under the brine it's fine Oh, submerging in brine conquers evil every time. Submerging in brine. <laughs> <laughs> the bad guys don't make it. They're both good. They're both good. Absolutely. Whatever it takes to what remember I, to keep it under the brine, and then you're you're in great shape. You know what I, I love in in looking at your book is that you have experimented with all kinds of vegetables, all kinds of flavor mixes, relishes, and and pickles and chutneys, things that. I would have never thought of putting this together with that, you mm -hmm. know, and I want to say that y learning from you that no two batches are alike, mm -hmm. you're really talking about something that's living. Oh, it's for like sure. A garden, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a set process. Yeah, and it's, it's wonderful because you can decide what your favorite recipe is and, you know, depending on the season, the time of year, where the cabbage was, were grown, or whatever vegetable, burdock root, whatever mm -hmm. you're deciding to ferment, you might get a whole different 
flavor each time. You know, within the same realm, but still that terroir of whatever is going on in your world when you make it. So I want to draw our attention as we close over here to this wonderful set of little, little um, vatches of things that you have made, all mm -hmm. different kinds of ferments, and ask you, tell me about Curtido. Curtido? Curtido. Because it was one of the favorites that people gave you. One of, one of these is Curtido. What's in it? This is Curtido, and it is a real traditional El Salvadorian crowd. It's got um, onions, garlic, cumin, oregano, and carrots. And it's one of our favorites in the wintertime, especially because it has that flavor of a fresh salsa when you really can't get fresh Salt. tomatoes, tomatoes at that time. And, and All right. Yeah. Okay. And then we called this our gateway kraut, and it is a lemon dill kraut, and it's just simply lemon dill and garlic, and it's something that makes people um, much more friendly towards sauerkraut. <laughs> really? The curtido is very nice. You're right. It does have hint, a sort of hint of salsa. Mm -hmm. So this has got lemon. Is that right? Lemon, lemon dill, dill, and, and garlic. Kraut. It's a oh, pretty garlic. simple kraut, and it's a much more... I feel like the Cordito is such a great winter crowd, and this is a much more um, fresh feeling spring, mm -hmm. summer flavor. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. It's lighter mm -hmm. yeah. in flavor. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the names you gave yourselves early are fermentistas, mm -hmm. right? Fermentistas, which is, which for me has a sense of these are artisans. They are fermentistas, <laughs> and your goal of having others of us become fermentistas. Thank you for. Thank you for your book, which is a way to help share, and your classes, Absolutely. and your website. Any last thoughts from you, fermentistas, that you want <laughs> people to know? Just enjoy the process. It's very simple, it's safe, and it's a great way to combine flavors out of the garden and enjoy something new. So just have fun with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank Please. you. Thank, Thank you, you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm with Kirsten and Christopher Shockey with some of the most delicious fermented foods you can't imagine. You will wish you could taste right through the camera. See you next time. <laughs>